In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Ameen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever, and to the ages of all ages, Ameen. Today we're going to continue what we started last week. And last week we started the Epistle of St. Paul to the Romans, chapter 1. We stopped last week at verse 7. We looked from verses 1 to 7, and this was the introduction to the letter. Basically, St. Paul says, I am Paul, to authenticate the letter. And grace be to you from God. And in the middle, he started, he got sidetracked. So he started to speak about Jesus Christ, his divinity, and his humanity. We said the divinity of Christ, how did this come to be? Well, begotten of the Father before all ages. But for his humanity, he was from the seed of David. Exactly. So today we're going to continue with verse 8. It says, First I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. Begins always with a, thank, uh, a thanksgiving. It always begins with this, giving thanks. And this is one of the major signs of St. Paul. Three things we always say about St. Paul. Always giving thanks, always praying, and always joyful. We see these three things in him all the time. Giving thanks, praying, and being joyful. So it's his first, I think, his first action, even before anything happens, he's giving thanks. Usually you think after somebody does something nice to you, but before anything happens, this is his faith. This is trust in God that everything's going to be okay. So he starts with thanksgiving. He says, first, I think. Practically speaking, he doesn't have much to be thankful about. He's alienated from his homeland from his people, from his family, right? So what does he have to be thankful about? The church is under persecution. And the church is not under persecution, is under internal problems. He's right now in Corinth. He writes the epistles to the Romans from the city of Corinth. So in that city, there are a lot of problems, a lot of big problems, big issues in that city, with the church of that city. So. He is torn apart, yet still he finds the, the will and the strength to give thanks. This is the right attitude, that he always knows that no matter what happens, God will bring, uh, will bring everything about to good. So he's giving thanks. He says, I thank my God through Jesus Christ. Why through Jesus Christ? He's apparently here speaking to God the Father. So he's saying, I thank God through his son Jesus Christ. Let's look at John 14. John 14, say, Jesus says, whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be, may, may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. And again, John 16, he says, most, most assuredly I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. And St. Paul later on, when he goes to prison in Rome, he writes the epistle to the Colossians in chapter 3, verse 17. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. When the disciples ask Christ to teach him how to pray, he says, when, whenever you pray, you say, Our Father who art in heaven, all the way up to the end. And the end came, the end came, and the words, right before the words, in Christ Jesus. The words, in Christ Jesus, when we pray in the Coptic Orthodox Church, we added these words, in Christ Jesus, because Jesus told us everything you do, anything you ask, ask in my name. If we approach God, not in the name of Jesus, not in the name of Jesus, what is He going to say to us? I don't know you. I don't know you. By what authority? By what power? By what right do you approach me? Do you ask anything of me? I don't know you. But through Christ, we received the adoption as sons. We became His children. Now we can come to Him and say, Our Father. Before this, we cannot say Our Father. Without Jesus Christ, we cannot say Our Father. There was this big barrier between us and God. Between us and God. Jesus came and knocked down this barrier. And as a sign of knocking down this barrier, the veil of the temple was torn in half. It was torn in half. There's no more, no more veil, no more barrier between you and God. And this is because of the action of 
Jesus Christ. I thank God through Jesus Christ for, for you all. He's thanking them for you all, for someone else. He's not thanking God. Oh, sorry, Mia, go ahead. Um, so people in the Old Testament, how did they address God? How did they address God in the Old Testament? God of Abraham, Isaac. He was known as God, uh, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This was his name. He was known as that. But they didn't just address God. You don't just address God. They couldn't say they couldn't say God. They had kind of a word that points to God. No, Yahweh, that's the name of God. Yahweh. But to say God, to say God, they would say the word Adonai or Lord. But not they, they couldn't bring themselves to saying God. Right? So when they stand up and, and pray, they don't just say Oh God, uh, our Father, and, and so on. No, they can't say that. They don't have the right to say that. Not until the, the New Testament comes. Not until Jesus Christ is born and adopts us. Okay? Adonai is the, is the Hebrew word for Lord. Okay? Even in the scripture, when they were reading something, and the scripture says God, they would have, before they actually read it, they'd have to go through all these purification rituals and take a shower and all that stuff just to get ready to be able to say God. And that's why when St. Paul wrote an epistle to the Hebrews, to get their attention, to get them focused on what he wanted to say, the first word in the book of Hebrews is God. As soon as a Hebrew man, a Jewish man, hears the word God, sees, reads the word God, he stands up straight. So I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all. Usually we thank God for, or we give thanks for something that happens to us, but He's thanking for them, for something that happens with them. Romans 12.15, He says, Rejoice with those who rejoice, and weep with those who? With those who weep. This is the true heart of a Christian that knows that we're all the body of Christ. When one member of this body is in pain, we're all in pain. When one member is happy and rejoicing, we're all happy, we're all rejoicing. If someone is successful, we're happy. When hear someone is upset, maybe he lost a loved one or lost his job or upset for any reason, sad, we're sad with him because we're one, we're one body. If your right arm hurts, all your body suffers, right? So this is a sign of his, of the purity of his heart. That even in the worst, worst circumstances, he's able to find joy in the nice things that happens to others around. And this is what happens with us too in the church here. When we stand, when we stood up to pray today, the the prayer of complying. What was the first prayer we prayed? Thanksgiving prayer. We always give thanks in everything. Before anything, before asking anything, before saying anything else, the first thing we say is, let us give thanks, always. Whether it's in a wedding, whether it's in a funeral, in a baptism, in any occasion, the first thing we do is, we learn this lesson, to give thanks. So I thank my God, through Jesus Christ, for you all, that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. These are not like little children that St. Paul is exaggerating and saying, oh, your faith is so good and so wonderful. He's not exaggerating. Rome was the capital of the Roman Empire, right? And as such, everything, everything pulled in there. All the thoughts, all the ideas, all the philosophies, all the religions, all the habits, everything pulled into Rome. So this was the heart of the pagan Empire, heart of paganism, idolatry. It was all in Rome. So to have kind of like, for example, Las Vegas. Did you know we have a church in Las Vegas? A Coptic Orthodox church in Las Vegas. So when you see, oh, there is a church in Las Vegas, never mind a church, there is someone, a Christian, a true Christian, in somewhere that's really, really, really bad, that, that person's faith must be very strong, must be very strong. 
So they speak of the faith of that person throughout. Oh, there is a person that's, that's very, very good and lives in a very, very bad place. But not only that, Rome, Rome was not very nice to Christians. The Roman emperors, mostly Nero, he was very, very mean. He persecuted them very greatly. He was vicious. He killed his own mother to get to the throne. He was a very, he was a crazy man. He was a crazy, and not only to his family, to, especially to Christians. He invented ways of persecuting, of torturing Christians. So their faith must have been very strong and because of this was spoken of throughout the whole world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit, in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing, I make mention of you always in my prayers. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit, in the gospel of his Son. Because of his background, St. Paul was educated in the Greek philosophies, as well as the Jewish law. So because of this background, because of this background, he was ordained as the apostle for the Gentiles. He's able to relate to them. He's able to speak to them, speak the same language, think the same way. Go wherever they are and bring them up to wherever they need to be. This was St. Paul. Whom I serve with my spirit. The Jews used to worship God, not as the Christians do. The Jews were very, very literal in their worship. They had the law and they followed it and they followed it to the letter. Everything, all the rituals, all the sacrifices, all everything, they followed it exactly as the law dictated, too literal. How many times did they sacrifice the Passover lamb? And not once did they think of the Messiah. So that when the true Messiah came, they couldn't recognize him. The Passover lamb to them was just a lamb that they killed on a certain day of the year. And this was it. This was it. But the Gentiles, on the other hand, were into more of a physical kind of worship, of whatever God they worshipped, right? They had these, for example, when they go and they worship some sort of pagan, a pagan god, they have these uh, rituals that they do and these sacrifices that they do. And you see that, for example, when they practice sorcery, they have, uh, it's like a show. They say all these magic words and uh, they have these clothes that look very theatrical, very, very scary. But so to them, the worship was very physical. But in Christianity, we worship God in, in spirit. And Christ himself told us this. The hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. He said these words to the Samaritan woman. When the Samaritan woman asked, do we worship God on this mountain or do we worship him on that mountain? He told her, why are you being so literal? Do you think God is the God of this mountain and not the God of that mountain? The hour is coming and now is when the true worshippers of God will worship the Father in spirit and truth. Cheers. So, I believe that it's not bad to be literal. But at the same time, it's not bad to be spiritual. But so far, I think that all of them do not have to be spiritual. So they are not literal and are not spiritual. So, what when they I just would like to switch the word spiritual with the word neglect. Okay? In, in um, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, St. Paul says, For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. The letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. So being too literal leads to being extreme. But in the same time, in the same time, being negligent and say, you know what? It's not a big deal if I do this. It's not a big deal if I do that. God is loving. God is merciful. This leads to neglect, to being negli uh, uh, to, to negligence, right? So the balance is being spiritual, understanding the spirit of the commandment and living that spirit. Mm -hmm. You have to start with being literal, or else you will never get 
get to the new spiritual aspect of it. <laughs> Whom I serve? Is someone left? <gasps> On camera? <laughs> Whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son. In the gospel of his son. Someone might say the Spirit of God came to me and told me to kill these 10,000 people. The Crusades were all about that. The Crusades in the Middle Ages were all about fighting God's war. Right? Does that mean God really told them to go and do this and go and do that? The Spirit, worshiping God in the Spirit, in the Gospel of His Son. The Spirit of God will never tell you to do something that's contrary or opposing to what the Gospel said. Right? It's obvious. God will never send this, the Spirit to tell you something that He already told you not to do in the Gospel. For example, go and commit adultery. Go and lie. Go and cheat. This is easy to find out that this is not the voice of God. This is the voice of the adversary, the voice of the devil. In 2 Corinthians, St. Paul always tells us to examine yourself as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. And again, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, he says, test all things. Test all things against what? Oh, against the standard. The standard we have is the Word of God. We get a thought, we get an idea, we get a feeling. We always test it against that standard. Does it measure up to that standard? Because this is my standard now. This is the standard I live, I live with, I live by. There is no other standard, right? For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of His Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers. This is a man sending a letter to a church he's not been to yet, and he's praying to them always without ceasing. Okay, He feels a certain responsibility because he's ordained as the apostle of the Gentiles and they are the heart of the Gentiles. This is Rome. So he feels a responsibility towards them. So he says, I pray for you always. How many people did he meet on all these journeys, all these cities that he visited, all these people that he spoke to? And he can remember a few people in the city of Rome and he remembers them in his prayer, without ceasing, and always. This prayer, it was a source of support for that church, for the Church of Rome. For that Church of Rome, right? The prayer of the saints is always a, a source of support. We don't see someone who is coming physically to help with that church, to do something to support them, to say something to them. But this invisible grace, he prays to God, and God sends His aid. Making request, if by some means, now at last I may find a way in the will of God to come to you. St. Paul, St. Paul, when people are healed simply by, you know, by the aprons or bandages that fall from his wounds, people that touch these things get healed. Or if they have an evil spirit, evil spirit departs. This man is saying, I just make a request of God. But even before you make a request, this should be answered. No, he says, I make a request. Because in Philippians, he says to us, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known to God. Let your request be made known to God. But God should know what we need and what we want. He says, but anything you need, anything that you want, anything you think you want, just request it of God. But don't be anxious about it. Well, what is not being anxious about? The definition of anxiety is painful or apprehensive, uneasiness of mind, usually over an impending or anticipated future event. You don't know how it's going to turn out, so you're anxious. Or you're worried about something. You're worried about, am I going to pay this bill? Am I going to be able to do this? Am I going to be able to do that? Is things are, are things going to be okay? So this is anxiety. This is anxiety. So when he says, don't be anxious, is, is he living in the real world? Does he know 
What do you mean don't be anxious? Let me tell you. Making request, if by some means, now at last, I may find a way in the will of God to come to you. So he's making a request. Making a request. What's the difference between making a request and being anxious? I said being anxious is not overly thinking of it too much. Just let the problem with God, let it stay with Him, leave it with Him. And don't think about it too much. But what's the difference between that and nagging? Then God again and again and again and again. As long as we know, we're sure that this is not against God's will. As long as the door is not completely shut. God, in this case, told St. Paul, you're going to Rome. You're going to Rome. So he's asking, he's praying for the fulfillment of God's will. That's all he's asking, right? He knows everything looks, seems impossible. Rome, Rome might as well be on another planet. There's no way for him to get to Rome. No way for him to get to Rome. He doesn't know how, he doesn't know when, in what capacity is he ever going to get to Rome. But he's saying, if by some means, because nothing with God is, there's nothing with God is impossible. Everything is possible for God. So I make a request and I leave it in God's hand. This is the man that was caught up to the third heaven. This is in 2 Corinthians, by the way. This is the man that, when I asked him, what did you see? He says, I saw when an eye has not seen, nor ear heard, neither have come upon the heart of man. This is the man, like I said, his bandages were healing people and casting out demons. Right? And he, for a long time, is praying about this one thing. Please, God, let me go to Rome. Please, let me go to Rome. And it's not happening. God is not responding. So what does he do? He's like, you know, if I don't go to Rome, it's nothing. What am I doing here wasting my time with these little no-name villages? These are nothing. I want to go to Rome, the capital of the empire, of the Roman Empire. If Christianity spreads there, it's done. This is, I fulfill my mission. Why are you delaying me? I want to do your will. This is what I want to do. Did he do that? Did I make my request, leave it with him, and that's it. Now at last I may find a way in the will of God to come to you. Just like Christ when He says, Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. I tell Him what I want, I pray. But at the end I say, not as I will, but as you, as you will. Verse 11, For I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift so that you may be established. He's been praying about this for a long time, to go and see them. But see them why? For what purpose? Oh, for their own benefit. So they can be established. Just like he went back to Jerusalem when he had a question about his faith. Is it right for Christians to become Jewish first or not? I think not. But I don't know. I'm not going to go spread my teachings until I'm sure that this is the right faith. So he went back to Jerusalem. Same thing here. They have some issues with their faith. He wants to go to Rome so that their faith may be established. That is, that I may be encouraged together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. He didn't want them to feel like they are the only ones that need his... He says, we both, we both will benefit from this visit. Just by me being in your presence, just by be, me being in your presence, the comfort of the Holy Spirit will fill both our hearts. What did Jesus say? Wherever and whenever two or three gather in my name, I will be where? In their midst. Imagine you go to a place far, far away. You don't know anyone. You don't know anybody. And out of nowhere, you catch, you hear something. Oh, I think I hear a Christian. You go and you talk with him and you meet with him. And all of a sudden you feel discomfort. I'm not alone. There's someone here that knows about Christ. I'm not here alone in this far distant place. So he said to them, 
that we may be encouraged by the mutual faith. Now I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that I often planned to come to you, but was hindered until now, that I might have some fruit among you also, just as among the other Gentiles. He wanted to go to them for so long, but it didn't happen. Why? Why was he hindered? It wasn't the right time for him to go. There were other places he needed to go first. God knew as soon as he sends him to Rome, what's going to happen? End of the line for him. This is it. This is it. God planned everything in his life, in this man's life, step by step. And it wasn't time to go to Rome yet. There was other things that needed to be done first. That I might have some fruit among you also, just as among the other Gentiles. What fruit is he talking about? These souls that he's going to win for Christ. And these souls in turn will have their own fruit, the fruits of the Spirit, like in Galatians 5.22, right? Since he was appointed as the apostle for the Gentile, he was in charge of them. He was responsible in front of them in front of God. There was a debt. There was a debt. He says in verse 14, I am a debtor, both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to wise and to unwise. Both to wise and to unwise. What debt is he talking about? What debt? Remember last time we were talking about how he received grace and apostleship. But the grace, the grace that he received was kind of a payment for a mission that God's going to send him on, payment in advance. So he was indebted. Like we are indebted to the divine love. Right? God loved us. He died for us. And then, and then, all this love, this is, his, this is the love that he says, you don't, have to, you don't repay me back. You pay each other back by loving one another, by loving your enemies. Every time I love someone, I'm just repaying a part of this debt, of this divine debt, of this divine debt that I owe to God. And that's why he says, I am indebted. God gave me this grace. God gave me my education, both in the Greek philosophy and in the Jewish law. God gave me this ability to speak. God gave me this, my health, even though he had a physical infirmity. God gave him everything. He says, I'm in debt. I feel there is a debt around my neck that I have to repay. And both to Greeks and to barbarians. We said that Jews and Gentiles, we understand what Jews are, and Gentiles are Jews, are Jews. And Gentiles is everyone else. Is everyone else. So the barbarians are to the Greeks, as to the, the Gentiles to the Jews. The Greeks are pretty much everyone who is educated, who is wise. And they thought that the barbarians, everyone who is unwise, is beneath them. Is beneath them. Right? So they call them barbarians. So he says, I have this debt, but not only to the Greeks, but to the, to the barbarians. Not only to the wise, but to the unwise. For as such is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. So as much as it in me, all that I have, all that I own, all that has been given to me by God, all of this, this is what I'm going to use to repay this debt. I will hold nothing back. I will hold nothing back. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first, and also for the Greek. He feels so bold about the gospel of God. He says, I am not ashamed. I'm not ashamed. So many times we sit in a social setting. We talk about anything and everything. Right? Even dirty jokes. We hear bad things left and right. We're not ashamed. We're very bold. But when it comes time to the Word of God, any religious talk, 
we step back, it's like, well, what are they going to say about me? Are they going to say, oh, what is he being too spiritual now? Has he been touched by God? What's going on? We know you. We know what you're about. Why are you all of a sudden talking about God? Why are we ashamed? Why are we ashamed? We have to overcome this feeling. <clears throat> Just as St. Paul was indebted to the Church of Rome, so are we indebted to the community we live in. Every person in their place of work, every person in school, on the street, this is the group of people that you have to pay your debt to. Right? You don't have to pay your debt to people in church. So while we're in church, we talk about God, we talk about Christianity, we talk about all this nice stuff. These people have their own debts to pay. And they're not going to be paying them to you. No, they're also going to be paying them to people outside. So the spiritual talk is not only for inside this church, but it's outside. For, for it is the power of God to salvation. The Word of God is power, is the power of God. This is the road map to heaven. This is the plan laid out very clearly. In 1 Corinthians, he says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. It is the power of God. What am I going to go, I think, sometimes? Go to my friends, say to them, Oh, I preach to them the cross. I like, you know, to, to talk to them about powerful things, nice things, comfortable things, but not the cross. Not the cross. You can't be ashamed of the cross. The cross, the cross is my honor. He says, far be it for me to boast in anything but the cross. Anything but the cross. And it is the power of God to salvation for everyone. Not for everyone. Can you imagine? As powerful as the cross is, there is still one more thing, one more ingredient that needs to be added. And that is faith. The power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. Faith is only though the first step. Before it, there's nothing to do. But if we stop at this step, we're not going to get anywhere. St. James chapter 2 is all about this. He says, you believe that there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. Imagine, have you ever believed so much? You just start to shake. Your faith, just, I believe. Even the demons can do this. This is how higher, how much faith they have more than us. Faith without works is dead. And he goes on to say, for the Jew first, and also for the Greek. For the Jew first, and also for the Greek. Does God have favoritism? Does He have like first class heaven for the Jews? And then, you know, the Gentiles, back, second class, or the nosebleed nose section, just somewhere. You just stand somewhere in the back. No, this is chronologically speaking, right? He came to them first, and He gave them His law. Right? And all the prophecies. So, a Jewish man should know very well about the coming of the Messiah, and the cross, and the birth from the Virgin, and should know all of this stuff. And wouldn't you believe it, the first people who rejected Him were the Jews. Were the Jews. Verse 17, For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. We're going to stop here today. The righteousness of God is revealed in here, in the Bible. Why does the righteousness of God need to be revealed? Is He righteous only because of this, only because it was revealed? God's righteousness is complete, with or without us. But it is revealed for our sakes, for us to believe in Him, for us to love Him, and for us to be righteous like Him. He's our Father, and as His children, it's our job to follow Him, to be perfect just as He is perfect, to be holy just as He is holy, to be righteous just as He is righteous. 
For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. Faith to faith. Some interpretations think that this is St. Paul speaking about the Old Testament and the Jewish faith and the Jewish faith and where Christ was prophesied to Christianity where these prophecies were fulfilled. Some other interpretations are talking about faith as in the form of a candle. The disciples lit their candle from the source himself, from Christ. And they came and lit this candle in the church. The faith, our faith. So from faith to faith. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. The just shall live by? By faith. The just as in justice, as in the justified, the righteous shall live by faith, not by deeds, not by deeds. It's by faith. Faith leads to deeds. But without faith, without faith, you can do all the deeds in the world. You can do all the deeds in the world. But without faith, there is no, there is no righteousness. And this faith, by this verse, the just shall live by faith, is in Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 4. It's in the Old Testament. So all along, God's plan was faith. It's not the law. It's not the law of the Old Testament. The law was simply to wake up their minds, to alert their minds to the coming of the Messiah, the coming of Christ. But faith, faith was the way all along. Then be the glory forever and ever. Amen.